using some King James Version. Okay, I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth, King James, New King James. But I like what King James says in Matthew 24, 21 through 22, Jesus is speaking. And what he refers to, you do not want to be there when it happens. If you think things are bad now, this is a walk in the park on a sunny day compared to what's about to take place. Jesus so clearly warned, he says, then there shall be a great tribulation. Now, great tribulation begins in the middle of the tribulation period. The first three and a half years are bad enough, but then it gets really bad. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, never shall be. And except those days should be shortened. Look what he says. Unless those days be shortened, it's going to be so bad there, shall be no, there should no flesh be saved. No humans would be alive. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Let me just remind you, the elect's sake there is Israel. Not the church. Because the church is not going to be here. All right? Do you understand? Praise God. This morning, I'm going to talk to you on what to do if you miss the rapture. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning. Lord, help us. Every one of us, those of us who are here in the sanctuary, those who are watching live streaming, those who are watching this video later to understand the words of Jesus, that there is coming a tribulation and a great tribulation that has never been seen. The events of that day are, are, have never been seen on planet Earth. They will make the worst of the worst of times that, that has ever happened. Even the horrors of World War I and World War II look like child's play compared to what's about to take place. And Lord, yet the vast majority of mankind will be left behind. The vast majority of the church, I should say, will be left behind to face this very horrific, terrible time because they have rejected you. And Father, today we ask that you would help us to understand that our time is limited. Our time is up. Very soon, Jesus is coming for a bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. So, Lord, we pray today that you would not only alert us to the very thing that's happening before our very eyes, but help us to be bold about our faith before the midnight hour approacheth. Now, put your hand on your heart and repeat this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart this morning. Open my eyes to see and open my ears to hear. And dear Jesus, change my heart today. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise God. This morning's message is not specifically for us. Directly, it's not for you. It's for those who are about to be left behind. I know some would say, well, I should have just stayed home today. No, because you need to hear what God says about the events that are about to take place. And once again, I, I, I don't know what it's going to take, but it, some of you, and I'm, I'm not talking to all of you, but some of you need to wake up and know that it's time to, to tell your family and friends. If you think that God is jesting, that these things that Jesus talked about aren't really going to happen, think again. See, here's the problem. Here's the problem. The Word of God says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Now, if you can go to that next slide. Looking for the blessed hope. That's the church. You and I who, are, who make up the bride of Christ, we are looking for that blessed hope. The blessed hope is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, we know that He's coming back for us any day. If you truly are born again and saved, you know that Jesus could come back at any time. We've already talked about that. But the problem is there is a lot of people out there that said, yeah, 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 I've heard that many times. I've heard about the rapture, and you got this group saying Jesus is coming back before the tribulation. you got another group saying Jesus is coming back at the end of the tribulation. you got another group that says Jesus is coming at the middle of the tribulation. And you got a whole lot of people saying Jesus isn't coming back at all. And they all say they're, they got the truth, and they all use Scripture. So what makes you think you are right? How many know that God is not the author of confusion? Do you honestly think, brother and sister, when 
the church was birthed on that day when Peter preached. When they came out of that upper room, remember? And the Holy Spirit convicted the people. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? Because Peter preached the most powerful message ever to be preached on the cross and Jesus being crucified. And Peter yelled out, repent and believe on Jesus Christ. And on that day, the Bible says, there, see, there was 120 in the upper room. Then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were added to their number in one day. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good day. I'd be happy if three got added in one day. Come on. But 3,000? And, and immediately they began to meet. Now, they didn't all meet in one big mega church. They met in homes. But the Bible says the church began to meet together, and they what? Devoted themselves. Acts 2.42. Now, listen. Acts 2.42 says, and they came together, and they devoted. That means they decide, decidedly dedicated. They decided to dedicate themselves, devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrines. Why? Because the apostles had the truth. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have no Bibles. They didn't have any handouts. They didn't have anything. They didn't have no booklets or anything. All they had was the apostles' doctrine. But do you honestly think that the early church was confused? That they would sit and listen to the teachings of the apostles saying, well, when is Jesus coming back? And, and John says, he's coming back before the tribulation. Paul and old, old, uh, um, um, Peter said, no, 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 he's come back at the end of the tribulation. Oh, no, 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 T Thomas speaks up. Bartholomew says, I'm with Thomas. He's coming back in the middle of tribulation. And old Philip says, no, 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 he's not coming back at all. <laughs> Do you think that's what went on in the early church? No, they were not confused. They knew what the apostles taught, and for almost 500 years, the early church taught the pre-tribulation rapture. The problem is, the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. The pre-tribulation rapture brings peace. It brings hope. So why do we have all the confusion today? Can I, can I remind you what happened? What happened around 500 A.D.? The Catholic religion, paganism came in. It infiltrated. Satan infiltrated the church with all these pagan ideas and all these lies and deceptions. And for almost 1,600 years, excuse me, I'll take that back. Almost 1,200 years, the church was in darkness because of the paganistic teachings. So why is there so much confusion concerning the rapture and the end time events? There was no cons uh, confusion back in the early church. They were looking for Jesus to return at any moment. That's why the, the, the church of the Thessalonica was getting upset when several of their brothers and sisters began to die and they went to Paul and said, Paul, what's going to happen to them? You've been teaching us that Jesus could return at any moment. What's going to happen to them? That's why Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 through 18, when he says, don't worry about that because the Lord's going to bring their spirits with them when he returns and they're going to be united with their bodies for the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. But why is there so much confusion concerning the rapture and the end time events in the church today? Here it is. Number one, Satan has corrupted the gospel. Oh, has he corrupted the gospel. And he still corrupts it. And many centuries there has been lies introduced to the church, especially around 500 A.D. You got that? 550 A.D., when Christianity was infiltrated with pagan teachings that resulted in what is known today as Roman Catholicism. If you really want to know where it all started, it was then. That's why, thank God for the Reformation. Amen. The church came out of the, dark, uh, the darkness. And, and, but the problem there, what happened? You have a bunch of denominations popping up, and you got this teaching this and this teaching that. But in the church today, and I'm talking about the, the, the church right now, the modern church, there are two lies that are being taught. And they're big lies. Number one, amillennialism. You know what amillennialism is? is? It means that Christ, there, yeah, that everything that happened concerning end times was fulfilled immediately after Christ went to the cross. We're not in, we're, we're in the millennial age right now. That, that, that's ridiculous. That means... All major denominations teach this lie because they do not take God's word literal. How many times do we read in Revelation chapter 20, Jesus is coming back to set up his millennial reign. Millennial means 1,000 years. 
what they teach, oh, that, that's, just, that's just symbolic. We don't want to take that literal. Everything that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21 was already fulfilled. It's not happening today. I, I beg to differ. Those signs that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke 21 are happening. The birth pains are increasing. Come on. Listen, when God said there's going to be a 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth, I got news for you. That is literal. 1,000 year reign on Christ on earth. What is the second deception that's been brought in the church today? It's called dominion, kingdom now theology. The latter reign, lie. All these apostolic, new apostolic churches that are teaching this, that the church has to infiltrate society, the seven mountain mandate lie, for Christ cannot return until we make the world better. Once we make the world better, Jesus will then decide to come back. I asked a new, new apostolic reformation person one time several years ago, how's that working out for you? Come on, how's that working out for you? Are things getting better? Come on. You see, that's why they were all happy and think, here we go, when Trump was elected president. And then God, you know, kind of threw him through a loop. Biden got in there. And, they, and they're still on TV saying, here, Trump's coming back in 2024. God's going to get it right this time. All these NAR prophets, how many have heard them? And, oh, this is going to be through Donald Trump. God's going to bring America, make America into a great nation, and we're going to have a worldwide revival. I'm here to tell you the only revival I see going on is revival of lawlessness. Not a revival, but a revolt against God's word that's going on. Why do they teach such things? Because they do not take God's word literal. They do not take God's word, word literal. So they teach that dominionism is that we've got to make the world better. Then Jesus will come. We're not gonna, it's not going to happen. There are no scriptures for that. My Bible says uh, deceived men will get worse and worse. There's also the teaching of replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel. I got news for you, brother and sister. We have not replaced Israel. In fact, if you want to know what the tribulation period is all about, it's all about Israel. If you understand that, then you will not be deceived. Okay? And this is taught in many word of faith and all new apostolic reformation churches. So what does the Bible clearly teach? What do we believe in this church? Well, we teach the premillennial dispensationalism is the truth, for it is taking God's word as being literal. So if you want to know what that means, premillennial dispensationalism, we believe that we're in the dispensation of grace right now. And that's about to end. As soon as the church is taken out, there's not going to be a church on earth no more. Oh, there will be a lot of false churches, but they don't belong to Jesus. The true church belongs to Jesus, right? He is the head the church is the body. He is the eternal groom. The church is the eternal bride. Soon, Jesus is going to come, and we believe God's word is to be taken literal. All right? Come on. I mean, where do you, if, you're, if you're going to say this is symbolic or that's symbolic, where do you draw the line? Come on. Let me give you an example. We believe in the literal rapture and the catching up of the saints. We believe when Paul wrote those words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that when we're, we're going to be changed in a moment, twinkling of an eye, that is going to be really happening. There's no symbolism in that. But many of the church say, no, 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 that's not going to happen like that. That's just symbolic. Come on. Number two, we believe in a literal, well, by the way, defending the pre-tribulation rapture, we defend it. Go to the next one. All right. The church is with Christ in heaven for seven years, at least seven years, before we return with Christ at the second coming. Amen. So we defend the pre-tribulation rapture because it's coming under a great attack. Why? Because there's corruption in the church. Come on. Yeah. Number two, we believe in a literal seven-year tribulation. Seven years. Now, when that starts, I don't know. It may start several years after the rapture. It may start immediately after the rapture, but the Bible says it will begin when the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, declares a peace treaty with Israel. Because there's going to be a great war called the Gog and Magog War. And, and God will literally fight for Israel. And there will be a man who will come along who the world will worship as their God, who will say, no, 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 we cannot have this because we're going to blow each other up. 
This is why there has to be nuclear missiles and nuclear bombs involved because God's going to stop them and then the Antichrist is going to say, we can't have war. We got to have peace with Israel. And he will declare peace sometime in the middle. After the seven year peace treaty, sometime in the middle, he will then declare himself as God. And it will be during that time that many of the Jewish people will reject him and will turn to Jesus Christ because of the preaching of the two witnesses that are about to come. Are you with me? So we literally believe that there's a seven-year tribulation period that consists of God's wrath being poured out on unrepented Israel that will bring her in. There will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists come out of there. Amen. And also a, a wicked world because during the time of God's grace, they did not receive Christ. Are you with me? What is the tri great tribulation really all about? Here it is. The tribulation is a future time period when the Lord will accomplish at least two aspects of his plan. He will complete his discipline of the nation of Israel. That he began, remember he declared, I'm going to give you 70 weeks. But when the Jewish people, by and large, rejected Christ, he put that on hold. And there came the, what we know as the Gentile church. Number two, he will judge the unbelieving, godless inhabitants of the earth. The length of the tribulation is seven years. The great tribulation is in the middle, begins in the middle, it's three and a half years. Do you understand that today? Number three, we believe in a literal return of Jesus Christ riding on a white horse, a white charger. He will be followed by all of the raptured saints on white horses. Now get this. Those who teach a post-tribulation rapture say, we're going to go up and be on white horses and come back. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? One moment you're going up and you see Jesus, the next moment you're on a horse riding back. What do you do with Revelation chapter 19 concerning the marriage supper of the Lamb? What do you do concerning where the Bible says that the saints will get their white garments. Come on. You and I are not going to go up and make a U-turn and come back. When the rapture takes place, we're going to be with Jesus for at least seven years, seven earth years. But at the end of the tribulation, the word of God says in Revelation chapter 19, read it, verses 11 through 21, we come back with Jesus. We come back with Jesus and Jesus comes back and destroys, as the word of God says, destroys the false prophet and the Antichrist and all those who try to fight against him at the battle of Armageddon. Come on. The battle of Armageddon. They all die because he speaks the word. Amen. And he returns to the Mount of Olives where he establishes his 1,000, literal 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. Someone shout amen. amen. Now, do you see this picture? <laughs> this is kind of what it's going to look like. We're not going to be fighting. We're going to be riding. Come on. We're not going to say a word. Jesus is going to do it all. Why are we coming back? Because we're coming back to rule and reign with him, to help all those who will go into the millennial reign of Christ with their natural bodies, those who survive the tribulation. You get it? Now, that's a whole other teaching. But the reason I bring this up is because if you don't take God's word literal, then you're going to be confused about these things. For instance, did you know that there was a time many, many, many moons ago, there was no nation of Israel for almost 2,000 years? Before 1948, if you looked on the world map, it didn't say Israel. It said Palestine. And there were those who would teach that, you know, one day God's going to bring the Jews back in their land and they would laugh, say, no, 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 that's not literal. That is symbolic. God's not going to restore Israel. Israel's done. The church has replaced Israel. And then something happened in 1948, and it fulfilled a scripture. If you can go to the next slide, it fulfills a scripture that a lot of these very deceived preachers taught. 
is symbolic. Here is Ezekiel hearing from God. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. What do those bones represent? They represent Israel scattered all over the world. No more longer a nation. Then he, God, caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were many in the open valley. Indeed, they were very dry. They were as dead as dead can be. There was no, no meat on them. There was no flesh on them. They were just a bunch of bleached bones. And the Lord God said to me, Son of man, can those bones live? So Ezekiel answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And we read the rest of the chapter. God says, prophesy to those bones to rise up. And God, he did what God said. And all of a sudden, flesh became on those bones again. They rose up and lived. God put his breath in them. What does that represent? It represents the nation of Israel. Next slide. The miracle of Israel for 2,000 years. Isaiah 66, 8. Here's another verse that a lot of people couldn't figure out because they don't take God's word literal. Whoever heard of such a thing, Isaiah prophesied. Who has ever seen such things? Is a country born in one day? Is a nation brought forth all at once? Yes, it happened on May the 14th, 1948. Do you see that Israel is reborn? The valley of dry bones prophecy was fulfilled. It's not symbolic. It is literal that God, what God said to uh, Ezekiel, although the bones did not take on flesh the nation of Israel that was dead came back someone shout amen and since that time God has been calling the Jews back into her land now what's that got to do with missing the the, the rapture everything because the tribulation period that's about to begin has everything to do with God dealing with the nation of Israel again amen you see, the parable of the fig tree represents Israel flourishing in the last days. You have to understand this. Are you with me? You see, Jesus taught this in Luke's gospel, chapter 21. When he taught this, he was talking about the birth pains. You'll find the same teaching in Matthew chapter 24. Are you with me so far? Am I going too fast? All right. So Jesus is saying, now listen, I, he, he just got done giving the, the, the birth pains, and then he turns right around and he spoke to them a parable. Now, he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Why did he mention a fig tree? Because you're going to find out the fig tree was cursed. The cursing of the fig tree that he did a little earlier represented Israel's rebellion, no, no longer producing fruit. But God did not give up on her. They're still the apple of God's eye. Someone shout amen. amen. So Jesus said when they are already budding, when you see the fig tree budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. The illustration for you and I is when we see a tree budding, we know that spring is here and summer is coming. Verse 31, Jesus says, so you also will know. Now look at this. So you will also know when you see these things happening now that the kingdom of God is near. Why? Because Jesus cursed the fig tree in Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. He goes to the tree. It did not have any fruit and he cursed it so that it would not bear any more fruit. Why would he do such a thing? It was to represent Israel because he turns right around just a few chapters later. In Matthew chapter 23, before he gives his Olivet Discourse concerning the end time birth pains, He's up on the Mount of Olives and he's weeping. Our Lord is weeping because he's broken hearted because the very ones that he had come to has rejected him by and large. And he says in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. See, your house is left desolate. There is your dry bones. There is the cursed fig tree. Verse 39, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you see that? When Jesus is returning at the end, at the second coming, that is God's elect 
Israel, who welcomes him. Come on. Not the church. Go back to Luke 21, verse 31. So when you see all these things happening, turn to your neighbor and say, when you see all these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. What kingdom? The 1,000 year reign of Christ. We are seeing the fig tree bud right now. We are seeing the leaves come. Come on. Are you with me? Go to the next one. Look at here. Look at. All right. Verse 21, verse 32. Assuredly, I say, Jesus said to this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Someone shout amen. amen. Jesus follows it up with these words. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You see, if you take the Lord's word as symbolic, then you are calling him a liar because he makes it very clear. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus is speaking literal. Then he says, but take heed, verse 34, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, <clears throat> with drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. Hmm. Who is he referring to? He's referring to those who are going to be left behind, who are going to see the things that he warned about. And look at this when he talked about the tribulation period. Look, 21, 35 through 36. For it shall come on as a snare on some, all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Is Jesus speaking figuratively now? No. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus said, pray, watch, be living for me, so when I return, you will be part of my bride, the church, and stand before me at the wedding supper of the Lamb, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you getting it today? Someone shout amen. amen. You see... Take a look at that tree up there in the newspaper clipping from May the 14th, 1948. The fig tree is budding. Amen. And I've often said, please understand this. Get your eyes off of America. America is a corrupt nation. America is part of the, it's the beast system. Get your eyes on Israel. Because if you want to be technical about it, everything is about Israel. Come on. You and I are just an, a wild olive branch grafted in. Come on. All right. The Bible is not an American book. It's a Middle Eastern book. Do you understand that? You see, um, we have made an American gospel out of it, and that American gospel is a false gospel. It is a book written to Israel mainly, and it wouldn't be because of Israel rejecting Christ. You and I wouldn't even be here. Come on. The church was birthed because Israel rejected. So what we see is God stopped the time clock at the end of the 69th week and said, there are seven more years and I will deal with Israel at another time. We are in the age of grace and that age is about, the dispensation of grace is about to end. Amen. But look at Israel. It's budding. Jews are coming back. The land that looked like a, 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 nothing more than a dry dump. For years, when it was trampled down by the Gentiles and, the, and, and, and all those Islamic people, now it's green, it's flourishing, it's blessed. God's hand of blessing is upon that nation. Shall many shout amen? Come on. Amen. Now, the, why is this about to happen? Because there cannot, Israel has to be back in her homeland before the time of Jacob's trouble. See, the time of Jacob's trouble has to do with the tribulation. So Israel has to be back in her homeland before that time. Amen. And it'll be during that time she will get her temple back. It'll be during that time the Antichrist will desecrate it. It'll be during that time God will show his hand of protection on Israel and she will learn who the real Messiah is. Not the man of sin, but Jesus Christ. Someone shout amen. Are you with me so far? All right. Now. We're going to talk about what's about to happen in the world you do not want to be part of. You do not want to miss the rapture. But what happens if you do miss the rapture? Once again, look at the words of Jesus. 
Just want to remind you, if you think, oh, I don't believe in the rapture, I don't believe in Jesus, or I, or I believe I can live my life the way I want, I want to remind you of these words. If you're listening to this, I want to remind you of what Jesus said. You can mock him now. You can laugh at it now. But there's coming a day you're not going to laugh. Right. These words are going to hit you like a, like, a, a, like a sledgehammer hitting you between the eyes. Jesus said, then there shall be a great tribulation. Great trials, great troubles, great problems, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. It will be a time uncompared to any other time in the history of mankind. Verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. If God doesn't shorten those days up, all of mankind will be destroyed. But for the elect's sake, and that's Israel, those days shall be shortened. Once again, the tribulation period is not for the church. It is for unrepented Israel and wicked mankind who has not turned to Christ. I want to show you a little video of what it's going to be like before we get in to understand what you must do if you miss the rapture. Are we ready? You don't want to be left behind. Because the Bible is very clear. At the rapture, again, man, we get sucked up off this earth. We meet the Lord in the clouds, and all this baloney fades away. But right after the rapture, shortly thereafter, I don't know the exact date of the hour, but man, shortly after that, bang, God's wrath is going to be poured out on this planet for seven years nonstop. You don't want to be here. And so if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. This is not a game. It might look something like this. We'll close in prayer after this.
you're going to have people that look at that and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I don't like churches like yours. <laughs> Gloom and doom. Why? Because I don't believe God would ever do something like that. Well, read the book of Revelation. Yeah. Wow, Revelation is just a bunch of symbols, don't you know? Just a bunch of symbolism, don't you know? Right. I'm here to tell you it's going to happen just like that. In fact, that video doesn't even compare what's really going to happen. Imagine all of a sudden out there on the freeway, unmanned cars, believers taken up, crashing, unmanned airplanes, pilots crashing down, unmanned trains, engineers, gone. It's going to be worse than you can possibly imagine. This is why Jesus said over and over, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He wasn't jesting. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't being figurative. He's being literal. Are you with me? I can't imagine what it's going to be like. Thank God I don't have to because I'm going home. But just in case you miss the rapture, what to do if you miss the rapture? Now, I've given you a handout. I'm not going to cover all those. I'm going to cover 10 very important points in the next 20 minutes or so. This is so important. First and foremost, number one, do not do anything crazy like commit suicide. There are going to be a lot of people who have mocked the coming of Jesus, who have didn't believe, who are going to realize, yes, they've been left behind. And they're going to think, I blew it. I'm going to end my life. No. Instead, repeat. Excuse me, repent. Instead, repent immediately of your sins. And know that it's your unbelief in Christ and know that... Uh, in the fact that you didn't believe that caused you to be left behind. Repent of your sins and of your unbelief and believe on Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died for your sins. Come on. Re believe now. He still will offer his grace to you. It won't be like it was during the church because God's hand of wrath is going to be poured out just like in the days of the judges. Even worse, repent. Acts 3.19 clearly says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. First and foremost, you're going to need God's forgiveness. Amen. Number two, this is important. Do not believe the explanations given by the government or the secular media as to what happened to the multitude of missing people. If you think we got fake news now, you ain't seen nothing yet. At this time, because the Holy Spirit will, the restraining power of the Holy Spirit will be removed with the church. All hell is going to break loose on this earth. Satan is going to have a lot more leash given to him to go out and do his deceptions. And the deceiving he does now through the liberal left media will be even worse. Now, there are going to be all kinds of lying signs and wonders, such as UFOs, everywhere. There may even be alien beings coming upon the earth, exposing themselves. I've heard that they're coming, the Nordics, the Greys, the Greens, and all these lizard people. I don't know. But if they show up, I want to warn you, they are not from outer space. They're not from Alpha Centauri where Will Robertson and his family got lost. They're coming from within the earth. They are fallen angels. They are demons. Do not believe that the UFOs took all these people up that just so happened to be those crazy evangelical Christians because, you know, we're a bunch of bigots and troublemakers. Mother Earth had to cleanse herself of us. And the little children you know, were going to be protected for a while. Mother Earth or the 
aliens will give them back. No. Once again, you're going to see newspaper articles like this one. You see up there. We read about that last week. You're going to have all kinds of explanations. And there will be many articles written on the rapture saying, no rapture, just a myth. Because you're going to have the Pope and all, uh, all these Catholics and all these other religions say, if, if there really was a rapture, we would have been taken. Because we're all God's children. Doesn't he say that today? And he will be one, the, their number one proof of the lie. But believe me, they are all going to be lies. There will be all kinds of explanations given out. No, that UFOs did not take us. Please, know that it was Jesus who came for his church as he promised he would do. God's not a man that he should lie. Amen. Number three, this is very important. Stay off the internet, the landlines, and get rid of your cell phone. How many of you know right now everything we say and do, everything we put on Facebook, everything that we write on the internet, it's being monitored. There is a profile of you and I right now being made by the globalists. They know who I am. They know where I stand. I have a, there's enough evidence against me to be used for them to put me away because of what I post and what I preach and what I teach. Same with you right now. The 5G network wasn't just to have better cell phone reception. It was also to be able to read your eyes. Now, some would say, oh, that's a conspiracy. I have looked into it. The cameras, they needed to read our eye retinas, and the way to do that is to cover the face of everyone. They can identify you now if you're driving in a car, if you're trying to get away from all the cameras, by looking at your eyes. You cannot hide. Think about that. During this time, if you try to get away from the government, the government's going to stay, everybody's going to stay home. There's going to be all kinds of things happening during this time, such as you're going to have to go and register yourself where you're living. You're going to have to then report. Soon that will become part of the beast system where you're going to have to get the mark. And if you don't register and if you don't submit, they're going to come for you. Hear me. If you talk on your cell phone, they're going to know where you're at because your cell phone identifies your location. If you're on your landline, it identifies that you're there. If you're on the Internet, wherever you have your computer at, they know where you're at. Get rid of it all. Get rid of all electronics. Are you hearing me? Look at this. Big Brother technology through the 5G network. What do you think the 5G is all about? It's about monitoring, not about better cell phone reception. Are you getting it? It's worldwide. You get on Google, you get on Facebook, your profile has already been created. They know who you are. Stay off it. Number four, throw away any electronic Bibles. Most likely, the Bible will be outlawed sometime after that. Get a hold of a printed Bible. Don't you dare use your cell phone Bible app. They will be able to find you. Get a hold of a Bible. Begin to write in it. Highlight it. Make the Bible your most important possession. Read these chapters. Now, you don't want to just start with Genesis. Because the most important thing you can read is Daniel chapter 2 to 12, for it explains where we are at concerning the last day's beast system. Matthew chapter 24, because Jesus talks about the signs that you're going to see increase enormously during that time. Luke 21, the same thing. Read First and Second Thessalonians, the whole book, and read the book of Revelation. Please, do not think the book of Revelation is hard to understand. Those who are truly born again, the Holy Spirit teaches you as you study it. A printed Bible will be the most important item you will own during the tribulation period. Number five, you will eventually be hated by the masses and hunted down. 
If you do not submit to the beast system that will be implemented sometime after the rapture, you rebel, you will be hunted down. It's happening right now in China. Every Christian in China is being arrested. Families are being told, if you have a family member that is a Christian, turn, in, turn them in and we will reward you. You see it happening in China right now. You will see it happen throughout the whole world. For Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9, you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Pray for God to help you and give you strength to endure. Are you with me? Mark 13, 13, Jesus said, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Please understand, you're going to be hated. Especially by those who give themselves over to the Antichrist and worship him. Every Christian on the face of the earth will be looked upon as absolutely being evil and wicked and must be destroyed. Number six. Do not in any way, this is so important, do not in any way under any circumstance align yourself with the world leader, whoever he is, no matter how wonderful the world says he is. Sometime after the rapture, there's going to be a man who's going to appear on the scene. I don't know how he's coming. I don't know what religion he may claim to be part of. I have heard it say he's Jewish. I've heard it say he's Islam. I don't believe either one of those. I don't know. Whatever he is... He may even claim to be from another world. I don't know. But he will be known as Mr. Wonderful. How do I know? Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, the whole world worships him. The whole world worships him. It says, who is like the beast? Who is like unto him? And the Bible says he will eventually, after the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, will go in and desecrate it. Jesus calls him the abomination of desolation in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. And whatever you do, do not take his mark. Do not take his mark, which will most likely be an identification piece, most likely a microchip that will be inserted under the skin in the right hand or in the forehead. It may be a tattoo. I don't know. But whatever it is, once you take it, you have sealed your fate. I believe, and this is a whole other teaching, I believe it'll be a microchip that will change your DNA. Because the Word of God says those who take the mark, God is going to cast into the lake of fire. Look at this, Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He, that's the false prophet, who I believe is the Pope, right now causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that's King James version and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name there's been a lot of debate on that number the thing you've got to understand is you won't be able to go to a store and buy what you need you will not be able to work what the Bible says, sell means you cannot work. You cannot make money without this mark. You can't go to the doctor to get your, your, your medicine. You can't go to the store to get milk and bread. You cannot go to a dealer to get a car. You can't do anything. If you take this mark, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six. 100, 3 score and 6 or 666. Six, six. Now look at this. Here's the warning. Why you must not take the mark of the beast. Under no circumstances. A third angel followed them and said. Now this is from Revelation chapter 14, 9 through 12. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on their hand. He too will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patience. 
patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus Christ. What is John saying here? He's saying you're going to have to endure this time. You're going to have to be patient, patiently waiting for Jesus to return. If you are tempted and say, I'll, I'll take the mark, but repent of it after I take it so I can buy or sell, it will not work that way. Because by taking the mark, you will have to make allegiance to the Antichrist as your God. Number seven. This is very important. Do not stay in the city. Get out of the city. Why? Because there's too many people. Do not go to a church. Especially because... There are going to be many churches that are going to meet after the rapture. They're going to fall in line with the Antichrist. I told you on Wednesday night during Bible study several weeks ago that most of those people who are looking for Jesus to return, that are setting up this, their dominionism, are going to worship the Antichrist. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, because they receive not the, a love for the truth, that God will give them over to the lie, the lie, the great lie there. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12 is the coming of the man of sin, the son of perdition. There are going to be millions, countless millions upon millions who will believe that the Antichrist is God. They will cast their Bibles aside and say there was some truth in that, but here is our God. They will meet in churches. They will talk about him. Get away from the churches. All right? Churches during this time will be under the leadership of the false prophet, who I said I believe is the pope. I cannot be uh, completely dogmatic about that, but that's my personal opinion. Get as far away from the city and find other believers in Christ and help one another and study the Bible together in secret. You're going to have to meet underground. Churches will have to meet underground true christians will no longer be able to have service outside like we do right now people know we're here today we we wouldn't be able to do that if you were left behind we wouldn't be able to have a church service we would have to go underground we'd have to meet secret come on find other believers to help encourage you to stay faithful come on are you with me number eight be prepared to suffer be prepared to suffer. You will not be able to go and buy foods and supplies like you did before. You're going to have to somehow, some way, be able to barter. You're going to have to learn how to grow your own food. You're going to have to learn how to do first aid through natural means. You're going to have to live off the land. You're going to have to work with other believers who are hiding with you. Are you with me? Number nine, if you are captured by the authorities, do not deny Jesus Christ as Lord and God and do not take the mark of the beast that may be offered for your life. They will say to you, just like they do in Islamic countries, deny Jesus, accept Allah, and we'll let you live. Many Christians in those Islamic dictatorship countries said, no, we deny Allah and we accept Jesus and had their heads sawed right off. We've seen pictures. This is what's going to happen during this time. Instead, be prepared to die, most likely by beheading, but it would be better, much better than to deny Christ and go to hell. Come on. As horrible it is and morbid it is, why are they using beheading? Because beheading creates fear. To see someone's head being chopped off is something that our minds are not able to accept. We can accept someone being put to death through a gas chamber or electric chair, or by, uh, you know, injection, watch them fall asleep. But to see someone's head rolling is a little morbid. And that's why they will use this, is because it's to cause fear. Remember, Satan is the author of fear. See, the Word of God says that everyone who is living for Christ during this time and is caught will be beheaded. Look at this, in Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw the thrones, and they, they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. They did not worship the beast. They did not take his mark, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Amen. 
So you still have a chance, but there's a good chance you're going to be put to death. This is why Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, fear God, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Are you with me? Finally, number 10, before we pray. Be determined to endure to the end and encourage others to do so from God's word. Endure. You can count down the days. From the time that the Antichrist declares himself God, you can count down three and a half years till the coming of Jesus. 1,260 days. But in that time, you're going to suffer like never before. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Do you understand this? This is why now we're handing this out. This is not a game. This is not some theory we have. We take the Bible literal. There is going to be a literal tribulation period. And it's going to make the worst of times we see today look like child's play. It is God's hand of wrath. I've had people say, well, Christians are being persecuted now. I get that. But they're being persecuted by Satan's followers. During the tribulation, it's going to be God's hand of wrath that's going to come down. If you really want to read about it, read about the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bold judgments in Revelation. The worst of the earthquakes that we see today are nothing compared to the earthquakes that are going to take place. There's going to be a meteor that hits, according to Revelation chapter 8. It's called a popus. It's coming. There are some who say it's going to hit on April the 13th, 2029. I'm not sure. Oh, is that the apophis? But whatever it is, it's called wormwood. And from that one meteor, countless millions are going to die. There's going to be all kinds of diseases that's going to make what we are experiencing now nothing. People are going to want to die and won't be able to. Sores are going to break out on their bodies. Demons are literally going to come out of the abyss and are going to attack people. God's going to allow it. You see, folks, do you understand? Are these stories, are they just horror stories? No, they are literally going to happen. Thank God we will not be here, especially if you know Christ. Amen. But think about how many people you know that don't know Christ. That are going to enter into this horror. It's going to make the worst of horror movies look like nothing. They're going to live it. What a terrible time that will be. Any questions before we pray? Any questions before we pray? Any comments before we pray? Take this and fill it out. On the last page, there is a place for you to write a personal message to your family and friends. Use scripture. Encourage them. Do whatever you can. Do this today. We're going home very soon. We're not going to be here much longer. How many believe that? With every head bowed and every eye closed and the music playing, please. With every head bowed and every eye closed, this is serious. This is why Abundant Life Fellowship constantly preaches Jesus is coming back any moment. This is why we are teaching end times prophecy. So God's people will wake up and know that God is not jesting. God's not making him a, a, a hint. He's telling us these things are going to happen. Are you with me this morning? Heavenly Father... I pray that we are all ready. It's just play some in, instrumental, please. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us understand what's about to happen. The rapture is imminent. 
the end of the book of Revelation, there is a passage of Scripture. Because although the book of Revelation dictates to us what will happen during the tribulation, after the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ that we will be part of, and then the coming of the city of Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem. There is a passage in verse, chapter 22, verse 20. This says, he which testifies of these things, that's John the Beloved. He who saw the things concerning the tribulation, Jesus showed him he didn't understand it all, but he wrote as he saw it. John writes, he says, He which testifies of these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Why did John write that? Because he knew what was coming. Our only hope is in the one who suffered, bled, and died on the cross. Our hope is not in President Trump returning. Our hope is not in any politician who is conservative. Our hope is only in Christ returning. There is no more hope in this world but Christ in him alone. And if you have not put your hope in him, you better do so today. Without him, there is no hope. This world's not going to get better. This world's not going to be changed by a bunch of Christians trying to infiltrate the different mandates they're trying to get out there. This world is going to become more wicked, more corrupt, more vile, more sinful. And if your arms are around this world, if you're living for this world you're going to be a very miserable person. But on the other hand, if you have given up and surrendered your life to Christ, and this world means nothing to you, Jesus means everything, you will have the hope, the blessed hope. You will have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Are you with me this morning, brother and sister? Now, I've said this several Sundays, and I'm going to finish it up saying again, it's time to witness. Do not, don't put another day off, please. Now is the time. Now is the time. When you get home today, you're going to need to talk to somebody. You're going to need to tell them about Jesus. You know you need to. Don't say, I'll do it next week. I'm going to talk to them at Thanksgiving when they come. You may not be here then. The rapture may have taken place. And they're going to go through a time of great horror. Will you today make a commitment to Christ and say, I will call my family, my friends. I'll write them an email. I'll do whatever I can. I'll send them this information. I'll tell them to write, watch this video. Anything you can do to get their attention. Be ready for some pushback from some people, but be ready for some to say, please explain this to me. Amen? Amen. How many of you today say, I'm going to do that? Because let me say one more thing before we go. If you walk out here and say, yeah, 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 okay, okay, and you don't do it, you know why you won't do it? Listen to me. It's because you don't believe he's coming. You don't believe he's truly coming back. If you put it off, that means, hey, I, I do kind of believe he's coming back, but not now. And yet Jesus said we must be ready every day. Come on. I'm not here to step on anybody's toes. I'm here to tell you it's time for us to be the church of the living God. And the true church witnesses all of the time. It doesn't wait. Amen. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. That we belong to the great bride. We belong to the bride of Christ. 
And one day you're going to come, Lord Jesus, and we're going to go back to you, to the Father's house. And Lord, you said in your word, when we're there, there's going to be a great rejoicing. For the heavenly host says, let us rejoice and be glad. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. For, her, for his bride, the church, has made herself ready. And it was granted unto her, the church, all the multitude of saints since the very per first person that got saved to the very last person that gets saved. It's granted for those saints white linen, bright and clean. For the white linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Soon we're going home. Soon we're going to stand before Jesus. Soon there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And soon we will return with him. At any time now, it's going to happen. Any time now. Amen. And you can say to me, Pastor, you talk about it all the time because it's in me. There's a sense of urgency in me. It, I, I can't shake it. There's something that's got a hold of me that every day I, I keep looking for him to come. You can get sick and tired of hearing it, but I will tell you, I cannot ever, ever get sick and tired of talking about it. Because I want to be with him. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Come on up here and dismiss his brother. So when you get time today, you go call some people. You talk to them. You invite them to church. You do whatever you can. But more importantly, you tell them that Jesus is coming again and they must be ready. Amen. Praise God. Will you do that today?